All right. Thanks everyone for joining tonight. Um, tonight we're going to have two speakers. One is going to be Ian. He's going to demo how to use embedded Python scripts in LibreOffice or OpenOffice, and that allows him to manipulate the writer, draw, and calc applications. Um, for instance, for an amortization of a loan. And he uses the alternative Python script organizer for that, which is an add-on to LibreOffice. And he's um, presenting that. And later on, time permitting, <laughs> depending on how long Ian will talk, um, I will talk about Redis, which is an in-memory data structure store, which can be used as a database, cache, and a message broker. Cool. All right. Having said that, I'll leave it up to Ian to get kick things off, and I'll shut up. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, right, well, as you can see, or hopefully you can see the, my first slide here. Um, I Just a bit of background. Um, I, I initially um, started programming with uh, Vax Basic, and then in about 92, I bought um, Visual Basic version 2, I think, from Microsoft. And uh, I later then played around with um, Microsoft's um, spreadsheet program, whatever it is called, um, Microsoft Excel, that's it. I, I played around with that and, and used the, um, uh, basically it's vis Visual Basic version six is, or a, a subset of it is the programming language um, behind Visual Basic, uh, behind Excel, the, uh, in, the embedded programming language that you can use. And, um, and then when I saw uh, LibreOffice and OpenOffice come along. I thought I'd dabble around with the um, embedded basic that's uh, part of the part of the those packages, and um, and since then I've found out that Python is um, is supported as a um, a scripting language that can be used with e either LibreOffice or OpenOffice, and initially I I used the Python. Um, I'll just say detached, or I used it in um, specified libraries, which I'll show you later. And uh, I've since found out you can embed the Python within the document itself. So that's what we'll get to tonight at some point. Okay. Um, I have a, a, a GitHub account called Ian Robert Stewart Bugs, and um, that repository has got uh, this the, the files I'll use in tonight's. Um, presentation and uh, after the presentation uh, tomorrow or something I'll upload it to our um, Hampug GitHub repository and it can go in that that uh, directory. Okay, so without further ado, um, what's this slide about? Python embedded in LibreOffice OO documents. Okay, yeah, basic is the default macro um, to, uh, to be stored within a document, okay? And Python macros may also be stored within a document. And if, if you're inserting Python ma macros, it's made easier using the LibreOffice add-on, which is um, Alternative Python Script Organizer, ASPO. Actually, you'll find it, it's one of these things where they came up with the acronym and didn't stick to it. Oh, it should be. Sorry, I should. I should have APSO. Yeah, I made them. Okay, I'm not sure what. what yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. It'll, I'll find out what the acronym is. Okay. Um, just to, another bit of background is on in August we have our Linux user group meeting, and I presented um, some basic programs that are embedded in LibreOffice or OpenOffice, um, and um, what I presented there was um, is, is in our GitHub repository, which is that link. And um, the documents that, that I included were a, a simple writer document, a draw document, which simulates piling for a house, and a calc document um, providing mo modeling of the amortization of a loan. And oh, we actually recorded that presentation if you happen to want to see it. That's the link to it there. Um, I'll just brief, I think the next one, yeah, okay, I'll just hold this, and I've got, just to show you the two, um, th this is um, using BASIC as the, the language behind behind this, and um, 
when I launch the screen, it basic draws the, the little diagram um, and it puts these three buttons on the uh, onto the diagram. Okay, and basically I can um, I can then model this diagram using these three buttons. So these are meant to this is meant to be a floor plan of a house, and uh, I can have piles um, at uh, six meter by five meter spacing, or I could model it using four meter by five meter spacing, or I could go four meter by three point three meter um, spacing. So uh, yeah, that that's with because there's code underneath, you can actually use the code in two ways. One is to actually create your diagram, which is what I've done. So oopsie, <laughs> shouldn't go doing things like that. Um, Anyway, I'll move, fix that up later. Um, the uh, by by actually programming this diagram, I can actually get a lot uh, greater accuracy in, in um, where the where things lie. I'll just zoom in. Whoopsie. Yeah. So, whoa. Okay. <laughs> I, I will demonstrate my greater accuracy in another one. But you see that if, if I manually adjust it, maybe it's a bit tricky, but that should be up slightly and uh, you know, it's not coming in in the middle. So, and nor is that one by the looks of it, it should be across a bit. Okay, so if, if you put in the right numbers, the boxes would actually end up in the right place. But uh, in this one, it doesn't look like I did. Okay. Um, Anyway, and normally to adjust the code or um, edit the code, you've got a built-in integrated development environment for BASIC. So you just go Tools, Macros, Organize Macros and BASIC. And then um, down here we've got this Draw Embedded is the name of my um, document. And Module 1 contains all these little um, subroutines. So um, we can edit them and for example this is setting up an A4 page and um, where we want the borders on the page and the number of um, units of uh, X and Y axis what we have for when we we're um, putting diagrams on the page um, but anyway there's that's all code written in basic okay and I can edit it here and um, I can run it from here and things like that. But th this it, this IDE doesn't work for Python. So um, we'll get to a solution or an alternative for that. Okay, so I'll just close these that one down. And the other a little example I, I demonstrated was here we've got a, um, a calc spreadsheet and as you can see, it's just got one sheet open, which has a create button and a clear button. And if I click on create, it creates another um, sheet called amortization. If we go and look at it, we have um, an example of a loan. So um, the um, principal is 3000 and we're going to pay it out for over 48 months. And so the, after for the first month we'll pay $75 in interest and um, that's how much we'll be paying off the principal. Well, our monthly amount will be 664 and um, the balance still to pay off the principal is here. So as you can see if we slide down you eventually get down to zero and um, this is the interest um, amount of interest being paid per month as opposed to the um, the principal being paid off. Okay, and then if we move this somewhat, um, yeah, you can see you know, if we go pay it off over a, a, a much longer period of time. Oopsie, oh, perhaps I won't do that. Um, oh. um, yeah, we can see the amortize the, the the shape of the curves basically changes with the um, ones the uh, this is interest amount being paid off, and this is the principal amount you're paying off in principal per month. Um, okay, so so that's what I, I demonstrated. So I'm basically going to do the same two things, but I'm going to do it with Python. All right. Um, 
So I, we'll just. I'll just um, start my slideshow again. Um, the writer document with two push buttons that execute. Okay, I, I, I've got a little simple example here, just using a writer document, which I, I could have shown you, but I'll, I'll just did as slides. So in this case, it's very simple. When we push clear, the, the writer document is a blank page. And when we push message, it puts up hello world, and, um, and I'm using basic, I'm using basic. This is a little message it puts up. Um, so let's see where where did it get this um, basic code from? So um, I think you're probably already aware that all LibreOffice OpenOffice documents uses the Open Document format, and um, uh, of any document is stored as a zip file, and you can always just use an archive. Oops, sorry. An archive um, manager to um, unzip it, or, and so here I've, I've used one, and it's showing me the contents of uh, I've called the file test writer basic message .odt. So um, if we look through these, one of the things we've got is meta .inf folder, and inside meta .inf is manifest .xml. And if we look in manifest.xml, these three, which I've expanded below, is we've got a folder basic standard module one.xml. And that is my um, code that that I've, I've written in the IDE. Okay. And um, well, this is just looking at that module. And um, so it's XML script. Uh, we don't, that was by default to put that in, so we didn't use it. So I've got two buttons. The message button, it will um, get the document and in it will uh, get the, the page and set the string hello world using basic. And you probably can't read that dark blue, I think it says and quote semicolon, yeah, which is the um, XML way of indicating a double quote mark or a single. With double quote, I think. And I've also got a clear button, right? And whoops. Um, the thing is, these two buttons, they need to be when you, uh, there has to be a way of saying um, to the to the buttons themselves how to get to the, um, uh, to these two bits of code, right? And so for the, uh, the push button for the, for sending the message, it knows to go to um, standard dot module one message button, and it, it it's within the document, and it's a basic um, bit of code that's going to be executed. And um, the clear button will go again to the document, and it, and it will execute the code associated with the clear button. Okay, so that that's a very simple little. Um, um, a writer document with two buttons on it and um, it just puts a message and or clears it okay now let's move on and oh, just one little look this is when I look at the code in the IDE this is what I, I see here um, I've got the message button um, and putting up the hello world using basic and I've got the clear button which is I'm just clearing out the code Okay, now um, I'm going to talk about the same thing using Python, um, but <laughs> the big but here. Um, we'll just have a little look first at Python when it's not embedded in uh, OOLO documents. And um, what you can do is you've got a, um, a reserved uh, folder in your uh, user account space. Which is dot config slash LibreOffice four slash user slash scripts slash Python, and that is where you can put a Python program, or um, effectively you can put a Python module in there, which um, the module will expose functions that you've written. So another program you write could go and get the functions that are associated with a, a, a Python program in this local script, and. Uh, um, uh, there's also 
a system wide um, folder that is allocated where you can put um, Python code into. And so this has got some examples in there which um, any user could run these. Um, if I'm going to run this particular program, which I can run actually from locally or somewhere, I must, um, it, it, it comes in using the Python Unified Network Object Bridge. And um, I have to um, set up with this using TCP IP port 2002. I have to set that up so that, um, that LibreOffice is expecting to hear from this particular program. Okay, now I'll just, I think at this point, okay, so I'll just escape that and I'll give you, do a demo of, of this. Now, first we'll do it and make it fail. So I'm in, um, I'll just, okay, um, here's my, my, program here in just a local directory off my desktop okay it's not in this directory that i talked about later on i'll put it in here but um you'll see let's see what happens so i and i also haven't done this yet so if we try and run this python program here it it should fail it should oh dear it worked <laughs> I must have done it before. Where did that come up? Uh, did you start LibreOffice already with that? No, I was going to show. It should add an error message. When I, I did. I, I started it before. Um, yeah, about quarter to six. Uh, seven. You could just close down all your LibreOffice instances and see what what happens. Yeah. Oh, well, it probably doesn't matter because I'll, I'll just try this again. That's that's starting it. Okay. Anyway, that's one error message that never happened. <laughs> okay. So so I've got this. So now I can. I'll just um, try running this again, and it and it should um, draw the plan in in this um, this untitled draw window I've got here, um, and it will be doing it by passing the commands through um through tcp IP, i guess so if i do that yeah so there it is drawing my little house plan so um so it, it sort of looks like you saw before with basic and and it, and it should work but if you watch what happens when i push these buttons i get an error message okay and that is because um it's expecting that the push button code, like there's one piece of code to create it, and then there's two other bits of code for one for each, or three other bits of code for these push buttons. Okay, so so what I need to do is put the push button code in the um, the dedicated directory. So if I just go, I think I left the code over here. If I just well, I run that little bit. Of, Okay, and I'll just see if I can find it here. Okay, so I've now put my program, a copy of it, in this um, kind of reserved directory. Okay, and I'll just um, kill that off. And if I... Right, so now I've made a, got a fresh page. And if I run my Python script again, it draws it. But now when I click on these, it's going and finding um, the, the, the link into my code in this folder here. Okay, in that. So... Anyway, I think as you can see, it's all pretty messy, <laughs> and uh, and it would be a lot better to embed the code in into um, 
into the document so you didn't have to do that so i'll just you've, now you've seen it you probably don't ever want to see it again so i'll get rid of that and we'll go back to the to the presentation david has a question um, oh yeah once you've drawn the grid within the writer can you actually have hot spots within the grid like i think like buttons david uh like mouse over something something would mouse over do you think um see what i mean when you put the mouse over something it would it would that's hide. a good that's a good example ian yes that's more or less the question um yeah well i can't say i've done it but um uh, mm, maybe not because you're actually quite limited if i can find the, the the widgets that are available um, with LibreOffice are are really quite dated when you compare like the widgets available say with Kivi or something like that for for a mobile phone. So um, um, yeah, M maybe you could have a label and then you know if you hover over the label, then the label will um, effectively act like a button. <laughs> Something like that, um, yeah. Um, my, uh, the, yeah. Investigation for next time, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to begin. Yeah. To the other question that, right? that Neil had, I mean, he yeah. said for later, but have you actually ever tried adding a menu item? Um, oh, sorry, can the application add a selection to a LibreOffice menu? Sort of like, I guess, in in sense of having like a sub menu that you can execute multiple different things rather than a button you have like a menu item oh i see um yeah well let me just see insert form controls see this you're not you haven't really got a lot of choice um this is you've got to bear in mind we're going back um a 20 year old product or something so the the widgets you've got available um i think there is a push button format push button, yeah bit up image up. control Mm -hmm. On the combo box. Yeah, a combo box. So below, the below that is push button. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that was what I was demonstrating was the push oh, yeah. button. Yeah. But if you want to have you know, a list box, will drop down a list and you mm -hmm. pick something from the menu on the list. No, it's cool. I think actually integrating it into the LibreOffice menu rather than having it in the document, having it basically oh, integrated in the menu itself. Like up, up. Can you see yeah. that? He wants it in that menu bar. Is it right, David, up there? Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. Maybe add yeah. something to the tools menu um, because I've uh, coded up some new tool that does all sorts of singing and dancing within the document. Oh, okay. Um, well, there's a chap that does know how to do it because, you see, I've, I've got – when you do an add-on, if you go to the extension man manager and do an add-on, which is what I've done, here I've got MRI – has been added on and and so that's modified you know the guy that wrote the add-on he's worked out how to modify the mean the tools menu is um, that a python add-on or is that a basic one or um, an extension of um it, it, it it's 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 i think it's both <laughs> um, okay. um it 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 basically you, you know with python you go um dir and then say an object and it will give you the classes and the you know um, methods and things like that associated with it if you do a dir of of, of any object and th this mri is is sort of an equivalent of that so if you've got an object um All right, then, yeah. then you say mri the object and it will tell you um uh you know all the different methods that particular mm. object has yeah so um yeah that's in fact i talk about that tool a bit later on um okay i'm so, gonna shut up again yeah yeah so i don't i don't know exactly whether i could at, at this see i'm sort of working in the page itself i'm not you know i'm sure whether i can go up to the level of of modifying these things yeah anyway um yeah that's another one to add to the list i think of, uh, to solve okay so so we've we've seen how 
it's not all that nice. And so let, let's try embedding Python into the um, LibreOffice or OO um, document. So we're going to make a, a little program which um, when you click on message, it will display hello world and it will use, um, what is it, sys.version uh, um, module to, to add this little extra bit so that it proves we're kind of using Python. And then we can clear it and um, we'll get back to a blank um, page. So... Um, um, let's unzip the um, the document, and now I think um, well we've still got this meta inf which contains manifest, but note it says scripts. Uh, oh, I think it says scripts with them. Yeah. Anyway, so now we've got scripts Python module pi, right? Scripts Python module pi, and um, and that's where my my Python code is stored within. Uh, um, or the name of the file that's um, in, in, in inside the um, the document. Okay, and um, what I've done here is I've had a, I've opened up um, module.py and I import um, the unified network object and I import sys and um, I have this interesting little thing called X script context and get document and that gets this particular or the particular blank page associated with the um, document and here I do a set string and hello world using Python and I add sys.version and um, when I do the clear it, it just does a set string uh, to null and I've added here there's this G exported scripts. I've got two functions here, and I this means I export the message button and I export the clear button. If I'd left it off, then all scripts get exported anyway, and I've only got two. So whether I put that there or not, but you could have a lot of scripts in there, and some of them you don't want to export. Um, in which case, you would just let's say I only want the message button. I would put that and and not have the clear button. Okay. Um, so that's some Python code embedded inside a um, a, a uh, writer document. Yeah. Now, when the buttons are pushed, this this changes slightly. Um, the 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 module dot pi is the when when we execute by pushing the button, we want to find the file module dot pi. We want to find the function message dot button or underscore button, and this time it's within the document like it was before with basic but this time we want python to um, code to be executed okay and likewise this is the clear push button okay so you you've now seen the difference between um, a, a simple little basic bit of code and the, the same with um, python um, now um, let's get on to um, what have I called it here APSO alternative python script organizer so I think that's the right abbreviation. And you'll see later that they change these words around. So we're going to learn about this add-on, OK? Um, when I've got alternative Python script organizer installed and I, uh, I, I drop down to my macros, this was the one you saw me use before, organize macros. And it came out and it had um, basic or Python. Um, we have, if I use those, and I use the Python, I can only get to the um, my macros and the system library. Um, by by using this organized Python scripts, which is this alternative one here, then I can um, do a bit more and um, we'll just have a little look. So here I've, I've said, OK, I want to go to my Python, um, my writer program, which has got a clear button and a message button. And um, I want to edit on, on this little alternative Python script organizer. I want to edit um, my, my bit of code. OK, and um, I have set it up. So I use Genie as a um, IDE for Python. And um, so here's this my module. And um, this is the code in it, import UNO, import sys, and um, on the message button. I, um, I I add to the 
blank page, I say hello world and, and I put the version of Python and then I clear it here. So that's the, the code which I showed before just in an editor, but that's it for, for real um, in an IDE if it makes any difference. Okay, so um, dependency notes. Okay, this APSO, um, you're advised to install the MRI extension for LibreOffice, which is um, a little tool that I talked about before. Um, you also get a warning message to say install um, Java runtime, is it GRE? Um, and um, so just put in install the default um, if you're on a Linux system and um, uh, install the LibreOffice script provider for Python. Um, and when you saw before, I'm using X script context. I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that when I install this LibreOffice script provider Python, when I install that, then um, that's what gives me this. Um, it's really a class, but it's written in all in uppercase, which sort of in Pythonic terms means it's a, a constant, but that's not the case. Um, and bear in mind that uh, LibreOffice, you can have scripts written in uh, I don't know, Ruby, I think, a um, couple of other language scripting languages. And so there is one of these for 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 the other language. So script provider, Python, uh, Ruby, or whatever it is. Okay, um, the APSO you download um, and and add on the the of the extension. So. Um, if I look at my extensions, I've got MRI already installed and a dictionary, and I click on get more extensions and I search for APSO and, and it finds alternative Python script organizer. If I click on that, it it has quite a bit of um, details here um, you know, explaining what it, what it can, be, can do. Um, and for those of you, this um, Hanya seems to be some Japanese guy that's been uh, heavily involved with open office uh, scripting for many years. And uh, if you ever go to the open office forum, then he often replies with um, some very good answers um, to um, scripting queries and stuff like that. So it seems like this was a little tool that he wrote for himself and then it's, um, it's become public. Um, if you go down, you can download the latest release, which is 1.2.8, and, um, and then I put it into the downloads folder and then double clicked on it to um, open it. And it, it wants me to confirm to add it to the extension manager. And once it's been added, it's sitting up up here as 1.2.8. And I haven't shown it here, but I'm pretty sure I immediately did a uh, check for updates and there was a 1.3.0. So, so I did update enough after that. Um, the other thing, oh, so you need to restart for that to kick in. And now that it, we've, we've got it, when we click on, oh no, we've got to go back. There's one, one more thing to do. Um, if we go back to the extension manager and we click on this, and options, <clears throat> okay, it, it, it's to do what options do you want associated with APSO? And, oops, what happened there? Um, so one of the options we want is we want to use, the editor I want to use is user bin genie, okay? Um, yeah, you, you, so whatever your Python IDE is that you use, you put that in there and, um, uh, and click OK, and then um, uh, one of the things you can do, this was my little program before, draw UNO plan, which, which used the UNO network and did a TCP IP connection into the, um, into LibreOffice. Um, if I, I can sort of ask for that to be embedded in the document. Not that it'll run very well, but it, it gives you all your code embedded in the document, which you can then um, go through and edit and um, and get 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 that up and, and running. Um, 
And um, the other thing that you mostly use it for is uh, now if I go to my writer example again and um, I've got a clear button, a message button, I can, I can click on edit and it launches my um, Genie um, IDE and and now I can look at the code I've um, I've I use to be able to um, write this hello world. Uh, this is a wee bit more a bit more trendy. This version um, I've added. I get some uh, some more information here, and I, and I add it to my hello world script. And uh, this is the clear one here. Um, th this is an example of, I guess, nesting. Um, w when when the uh, uh, when I, when the button is clicked, the widget um, object is passed to the um, to this function that's being to execute. So I pick up the button, but um, in, in this case, I want the actual URL of the file that is the document. So based on the button, I can go through all this nesting and then go up three levels and finally find the URL. And uh, and that way I can I, I can know the name of the file that um, that that I was using. So. Um, it's quite bizarre that, well, just to me anyway, that you can have so many levels to finally, it takes a bit <laughs> of digging around, but that's where you can use that MRI to actually help you find what you're looking for, which was the URL. Okay, um, what's the next thing? Okay, X script context. Now, like I said, I wasn't 100% sure where it came from, but um, in the documentation, there is this... Um, Interface expert conference context, and you've got um, get document, which is what I use, but you can get the desktop and these other two context things here. So I've, I've only used the get document, and um, um, this is a sample. This is the hello world. I assume I found this within the help files. Um, yeah, well, you can have a little read through that, but we've got a, a function here called Hello World in Python, and it gets the document and, and calls it model, and then it adds some uh, text. And where's the string of text? Uh, oh, there's there. Oh, it just sets up for adding text, and then um, and inserts the string there. Okay, which is kind of what I was doing before. Um, the the other way we did it when we were using this um, sockets from uh, and port two hundred two is that instead of using that, we had to um, instead of the X script content, we had to put in code like this to actually um, uh, get access to to the um, uh, write a document. Okay. Um, basics. Um, one thing I played around with. You saw before my hello world using basic. What I what I then did was um, when you click on message, not only do I write my little hello world, but I also extract the the code that get that my basic program. That's underlying um, executes. So, in this case, um, it, to be able to display all this, then when you click on the message button, it, it outputs the string "Hello World" using Basic, and then it calls this little function here, which um, it says then, yeah, then main, which is the return string. Is uh, basic libraries get by name standard get by name module okay so it's pretty easy and basic to dig out the basic code and then dump it on the screen. Now if we look at it with Python, I did the same. So it says hello world using Python, 
when I click the message. But then um, you saw this piece of code just before. When you click the message button, it uses extra context. It, it builds a string here, hello world, using Python. And um, I'll get the version number. And then dot get to string. OK, get Python script button. So this, it, it appends what it gets from running this little function here. And this is where it goes out, finds the URL, um, reads in the, the script, um, un it unzip it or something to find um, find the module embedded within the within the code, within the documents um, set of files. Yeah. OK, so um, that's a simple example. All right, so now I can just um, show you that floor plan again and the amortization with um, uh, but this time with Python embedded in the documents and um, oops it should say message box okay I've got another little thing there's a utility that comes with APSO so I'll just show that as well so I just exit out of that and go over here and we should have um, okay draw embedded Okay, so um, I've got a start and a clear. It hasn't, oh, let me just clear that. I shouldn't really have borders, grid, and piles at this point, but anyway. Um, so we're going to draw the little house plan in the, uh, on, on here, and uh, I think it, it sort of has some buffering. I think it executes everything and then goes splat. So if I click that. Yeah, so you don't you don't actually see it draw the picture unless I was to put delays between things. So um, it just seems to be instantaneous, but um, really that was a whole series of um, of things. So in starting up, I've also applied the code that's associated with these buttons. So if I click on this, now it's um, uh, going the the button knows that the um, code is is embedded from a doc you know, embedded in the document so um, it goes away and executes that so I can push these buttons and, and it can remodel the diagram doing that and if I want to look at the code um, I've got macros I go to the more complex organ uh, the APSO scripts and down here, Draw embedded and edit, and this has brought up my um, Genie IDE, and here we see the code. Which I'll I'll look at some some bits of the code which are perhaps more interesting. But you you're welcome to if you want to. Well, you're both welcome to. I'll put the codes online. You're welcome to have a look yourself, but uh, or, or ask for particular bits to be seen. Okay, so I'll just close that one down. Um, and the other one was the calc. So now we go to calc with embedded program. Yeah, as you can see here, we've just got sheet one. Um, so I haven't got my amortization sheet. Um, again, you, I can't show you it being built because um, it's too quick. Uh, um, well, by the time I get there, it's, so I create it, and you see it's it's now added an amortization sheet. And um, if I go to it then this is what we've we've got. We've got um, the monthly data based on how these are set. So if I make that a million bucks and um, pay it off over 48 years, 40 years, okay, then it changes. One thing I, it, that I probably should fix up is see how these little, how it's turned gray. It's because I've actually got 480 vertical lines trying to indicate you know i've got too high a resolution of data so i should only really be taking like every 12 months when i'm on on 40 years or uh, no, 40 yeah and then i'd have 40 lines across the page if i come back to here um you can see my my i've got a blue background with vertical lines um so um yeah 
either that or I would extend this chart way, way, way out, you know, to have 480 lines. So haven't kind of worked out how to, how to fix that. See if I go here, it just all goes gray. Um, okay, so that's uh, how you can, and you know, you can model this to various different interest rates. We can go up to 10% or something. Bit slow to respond. Yeah. And you can see how the, um, you know, the amount you pay in interest and the amount you pay in principal, how it varies um, as, the, as you pay off your loan. Okay, so that's, an, oh, we'll just, just to prove it, it really is Python code. If we go to Python and we go, oopsie, which one is it? Calc, that one, module. And, oh, did I did click on the wrong one. I can't edit it. click on the Python one. <laughs> okay, right, try that again. Uh, tools, okay, organize Python scripts, yeah. And module, and now I can go edit. And that brings up IDE again, and um, um, you can see the, this is all Python code in here. Um, okay, and in fact, let's, I'll just close that. Um, now I was gonna mention one other thing. Um, uh, I'll just actually I'll just go back to that one um, and we will look at the code um, to, I think I've left it the code in here you get do I have to do a lot of clicking with this if I go to the very bottom yeah for debugging the code I, I um you you know often you want to see what methods a particular object has and what classes and all that sort of stuff. So um, the only way I could originally think of it for debugging was to say, okay, do a dir of the object, which Python performs very nicely, and then pull out the the items and then open it um, a little bug dot text file and and write out um, whatever my string is here. Uh, which is pretty um, cheap and nasty by doing things, but, but it did work. And other other places, what was it? Looking for a property value. I want to know the, the value of a, a particular um, object or something like that. Um, then, it, then it will output the, the value there. So I had two little debug methods. I've since found out if I use APSO, um, one of the things is that... Um, Python doesn't have the equivalent of message box, which basic has. So normally if I wanted to a cheap and dirty way of, of um, getting some um, values out as I'm writing the code, then I would just tell the message box to display them and then run the piece of code until the message box fires and then I can see what, how I'm getting on. Um, so the a APSO add-on allows you to have a... Um, um, yeah, a message box, which I'll just see if I can demo that. And so, um, which one? A Python message box. And and I might add that it doesn't always work. Okay, so um, so I'm going to click on this message box, and hopefully it will execute this little. Um, button here, which will um, send out three messages. Actually, the first one will just say this is a message box. Second, will say this is a message box, uh, and it'll have a title, and it'll have two buttons. And and the third one, it will actually um, uh, do a dir of of a Python dir of X uh, script context and and display that. But I think. We'll find if I do this, I don't can't remember if it cracked. Oh no, it worked. Oh, well, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So that's the first little message. This is the message box, and um, that shows you it also works, and it doesn't matter which button you push. And then this is what you used to see when you see a DIR. So, um, you know, we've got the double underscore stuff, and then um, down here, this get document is the one that I normally use. But um, I could look at 
you know, any any um, bit of my you know, object I, I want to and get it. So that's a, a, a better way of getting stuff out. Um, there's one other thing I think I can do. If I go macros, organize script, it's my writer document. Um, yeah, I can go to Python shell. And this brings up a little console. So if I do the IR, uh, what is that not? It's a week. Ah, twice back. Oops. Okay, I don't know if my keyboard wasn't. So, so this is by default this is what I find as um uh in, in, if I'm doing a DIR and then if I go control right. and that should be what you saw before in the message box. Right. So if I need to know how to things work or what's available then then um, it's, I can use this little console yeah. okay um, and now I've just got one more thing to go if you can bear with me um, right, this, um, yeah uh, um, rather than actually scroll through the code I'll just scroll this here um, yeah. Um, I just took some screenshots, so of just things that are may may interest you. So, um, yeah. Uh, as far as I know, that the um, uh, writer and all, all these um, um, LibreOffice products are written. I think it's in C or C plus plus. I can't remember, but. Um, you have to, with you do a sort of a call like from blah 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 import size and then that means this um is a module i guess that you can can use so um for example with my drawings how do i wanted um uh the fill style to be well um i i imp introduced a constant called solid which can be implied so if i go to the next one um when I'm creating a rectangle, so I say um, rectangle, the fill style is solid, and that actually pulls in what, what you just saw before. And the, so I, I can put all that at the top and, um, and and how I want the line joint to be. Um, so that's sort of making use of Python. Um, th this is whenever I, the, the starting point, um, when I'm writing, a, a bit of Python code is I grab the desktop by doing this command and then from that I can derive the document get current component and then I return desktop and doc and that that's normally enough for me to then um, dive around the place and get to whatever I want to and uh, you know change background colors or whatever needs to be done um, just a little example of setting up a um an a4 landscape page i want to have a border area of 600 and the the resolution with um draw when you're using that is 29,700, so thousands of a millimeter um across i think yeah or hundreds i don't know thousands 21 centimeters yeah um and then uh one of the things is here I set some points to be able to draw. I, can, I don't know if you can remember my um, floor plan had a, a border right uh, right around it. So this this draws the border, and uh, I have this poly polygon shape, and and within a list I I put that previous list that you saw here. I make this into a position list. And um, that draws draws my border. Before I was doing it, I was drawing four separate lines, and, and it was a lot easier just to 
to, to make the points that I want to go to and then it, it draws a rectangle. Um, oh, I didn't actually demo it. Um, I could if you like, but I'm making use of layer manager when I was doing my draw. So um, on, on layer five, I had borders. On layer six, I had the grid lines. On layer seven, I had piles. So I can actually, this is initially creating those layers and making them visible. Um, but I, I can actually turn them on and off if I want to. So I can make all the grid lines, for example, um, disappear um, and, and, and be hidden. So if you're doing something like a, a multi-level house, then you could turn off ground floor and only look at level one or something, something like that. Um, in that draw document, I was uh, I had uh, dimensions using a ruler, so I feed in uh, x and y and the width and the height and a bunch of other stuff, and and this routine was used uh, over and over for for each time I wanted a ruler added to the um, uh, to the do draw document. Um, for the push button event, um, I just had one handler for the three push buttons you may recall but the push buttons i had given them a name of b0 b1 and b2 so um when the when you push on the push button you receive uh the button widgets object and um, you can then extract the name f from button source model dot name and if it's b0 then off we go and execute making a uh, pile with, so I think that was the six by fives, and, and this is the four by fives or five by fours or something. So I've got, I pull it out and go to three other separate routines. Um, the main menu, when you launch the main menu, um, I, you know, I clear things and remove the layers and then add them back in and draw the landscape page and put a board around it and on and on and on until I built the whole diagram. If I was doing it with um, something like uh, GTK or PyQT, then at the end of doing all this setup, I must then go into a loop to um, to keep the image up on the screen. Otherwise, it just all disappears. But um, in this case, the loop is really being run by LibreOffice, and I don't have a loop. So I just I haven't shown it. but after the setup, I get to the end of my code and I just say that's it, and and uh, and and it still stays on the screen because I've got you know, because LibreOffice maintains it. Um, but the thing is, you see here my main initialize. It, it, normally, if I've gone to a loop, then then these could be um, globally available, but it means that when I push the the, the message button and the clear button. They don't know. Um, they don't know of any global information about the um, that Python hasn't kept any of that for them because it's not in a loop. So really, there is. I write three separate programs. One is to set up the diagram. Uh, the second one is to handle um, uh, when, when the buttons are pushed. Sorry, I'm two separate programs because I, I have three buttons, but I only have one program to handle the three buttons. So. Um, yeah, so so that's that's a bit different from from if you're used to writing um, applications using say a, a toolbox like GTK or PyQt. Um, one of the things that would be nice if Python offered it, but it doesn't seem to. Um, see here, I've got chart dot diagram, and then then I get further down that um, x axis titles dot string is month, and so I'm going down and down and down. In, into these um, into different things I want. If we just look at that in basic, basic has this thing which is called with chart and then has main title true and put titles in that and then so with chart with dot legend and I can put things and then with chart uh, with diagram and I put things and then with chart with diagram with wall and I can I can add things. Um, so you know, I don't Unless someone else knows, and I haven't worked out an equivalent of doing that sort of um, uh, thing with 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 Python. You see, so Python ends up with quite a, a big long story at the front of each um, 
a property you're trying to change. Um, all right, this is just showing the scroll bars. We've, I've, I'm now looking at bits of code from uh, the CALP amortization program. Um, oh, I think I was quite... <laughs> You see how, how, how deep you have to dig down. You sort of go sideways and then you go up and then you finally get the the, the sheet that's called amortization. So that's um, it's when I when you click on one of the scroll bars, the event will be the scroll bar uh, object. And then you've got to get from that object, um, dig around to, to finally bring up and get the sheet that you, because it's the sheet you want to um, adjust data on. So once I've got the sheet, then I can find a cell and I can um, uh, add, oh, put a value in it, you know, based on the um, scroll bar adjustment. Um, and then I think I have three scroll bars. Yeah, scroll bar zero, one, and two. But but I, I just use the one piece of entry code um, when the scroll bar is pushed. And then based on its name, I, I determine what action to take. Um, oh, and this was my cheap and nasty bug reporting system, which, um, uh, yeah, like if if I don't find the, uh, the scroll bar name, then um, then just write it to bug dot text, uh, which I've, I can now make a message box, and uh, and I showed you those. Sorry, that was <coughs> my my cheap and nasty way of doing debugging. And that's gone around the circle. So I think that's that's about it. Now, if it hasn't confused you, nothing will. Um, let's just see. Was there anything on the slides? End. Ah, right. Well, I won't escape out of that. So, oh, awesome. yeah. Thanks for that, Ian. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's all right. Did, did uh, anyone have any questions or have they all left? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's still there, so I can read them out for people who are not on microphones. Uh, okay. Yeah. Alex says thanks. Oh, okay. Um, I should be able to bring that up. Any question from the online floor? Yeah, so once Ian has uploaded his code and documents and whatnot tomorrow, um, I'll, you're probably going to post on the meetup meeting that you with the URL, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yep. we'll do. Cool. Yeah. Um, and, and it was oh, right at the beginning. I mean, I've, oh. uh, David's asking a question whether you've tried anything with the uh, Impress um oh side of things whether you can create um like presentations automatically um I mean, you could, I could imagine that you can easily just have a file mm. that you're pointing to where you have simple text and then automatically generate pages with bullet points out of it so you just have yeah. to write uh, text files yeah um um impress is is kind of based on the draw um uh, application, but then um, when the slide shows are running, um, you can kind of uh, you you can kind of use the same like I could I could put up um, um, hang on. I could put up that house floor plan in in an impress and build a slide that looked like that house floor plan, um, but but. I can't have widgets. It, it doesn't support having um, uh, me clicking on widgets with Impress. You you, um, you can put a box and then you can say that if someone moves the mouse into the box and clicks in this box, then go away and do something, you know, like uh, move to the next. So, so sometimes you'll see on a slideshow it'll have uh, – previous and next buttons and the guy can click on those and it, and, it, and it knows that if the mouse pointer is in those uh, those two box either of those two boxes then to perform an action um, so the, the impress is not um, 
well, yeah, you don't have a, you don't have the, so much control over what you do. Um, yeah, that that kind of answer the question. I could I could bring up and press. Hang on, let's, um, let's save applications. Office. Um, I thought it was down here somewhere. Um, but you see, there's no, oh, oh, yeah, that's right. They claim there is, but it doesn't work. <laughs> In fact, yeah, so I can put a push button here, but if I, um, if I start, start from slideshow, it, see, um, that, that's, whether I push the button, if I push over here, it ends the slideshow, right? If I mm. if I start from slide and push the button, it ends the slideshow. So so although they've given me the ability to put um, um, you yeah, know these these uh, different form controls on there, they don't work. You know? I mean, yeah, I, I never got them to work. Can you change what event is being triggered by that? So if you click on the form on the push button that you have behind there, can you change yeah. anything in properties? So it's just the size. Uh, I mean, I could, when I'm in this design mode or whatever I'm in this now, that, that mm. would work, I think. You see, I can, I can control properties and I could, um, I could set it up that on execute it should do blah, mm. blah, blah. Okay. And that, that would work, right? I could have it yeah. like on execute, pop up a message box, and that would work. But it's when I go into slideshow mode, mm. okay, then, then um, it it's not really a push button. It's like know? an image, and that's it. And works. yeah, it yeah, on yeah. The image it just goes on to the next slide. Yeah, mm. and I I can't remember what the you you can add things, and they're normally down here. Um, oh, that's another. I'll, I'll I'll put it in the message box when I find. I mean, in um, mm. um, meeting, I'll put a little update in meeting when I when I find what it is. That, that you yeah. you add, you can have buttons that do do things, but it's it's far more limited than than the form controls have. Mm. Yeah. But um, but theoretically, yeah, you know, I could draw that whole little house thing and all that sort of stuff. But the thing is, I I wouldn't have those those three buttons wouldn't really work. Mm. Uh, so it's more actually for preparing a presentation, but not actually for using it as interactive elements. Then, yeah, I, I suspect that you know that they've um, they've they've left oops, those. Um, that's just been left in because I'm pretty sure what they must do is port the. Um, hmm. Yeah, they they must start with the draw document and then convert that into impress. <laughs> They don't start with impress and convert it into draw. Yeah, and so I think that's a bit that it was easy to leave the code in. <laughs> mm. So you've got these things, but they, they can't really do much. Yeah. In fact, if you do really go, I, I pursued that about five years ago and and, um, and, and tried to get them to, uh, you know, log it as a, I logged it as a bug with Open Office, I think, and uh, it's still open. <laughs> Might have been 10 years ago, yeah. Because no one, in one place, the documentation claims that that would work, that the push button <laughs> would work. But uh, yeah, nice and point. so, so I tried to say, well, it, I can't get it to work, and uh, yeah, it still seems to be the case. Mm. Okay, and yeah, my, my code is actually everything you've seen tonight is all sitting in uh, in, in my repository, including the including the. Um, the, the basic stuff, right? Which is what I gave at the beginning, the first slide I put up. But I'll put it into the to the ham pug one um, um, tomorrow. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's about it for me. Um, I hope it wasn't <laughs> too too obscure. Oh, that's all good. Thanks. Yeah. So, do you want to take over the stop sharing? Yep. Yeah. I will. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll turn my mic on. All right. 
All right. Now we're going into the eternal loop. Okay. Right. Um, let's just start that. Okay. So slightly different rather than having a um, user facing um, graphical application, we're going to do a little bit more behind the scenes. So a while ago, uh, working on a project, uh, we, rather than using file polling for doing stuff, we wanted to um, have an in-memory database and something that popped up was Redis. And um, not only can it be used sort of like as a data structure store, but it can also be used as a message broker. Um, and the project that I was working on is a deep learning one. So quite often we, work with deep learning frameworks that operate in Docker containers. So the easiest is usually just sort of like file in, file out for processing something. For instance, an image in and you get some predictions out. For instance, you're trying to find flowers in an image of the, I don't know, of a meadow. Um, and uh, out is what you get sort of a little JSON file with um, locations of where you have flowers in that particular image. And, um, if you're processing a lot of images, then it's not necessarily the greatest on your SSD because it wears out quite a lot. And if you're processing tens and tens of thousands of images, sooner or later, your SSD will give up the ghost way before it's supposed to disappear. But anyway, so um, alternative was then sort of like using an in-memory database. And um, that's where Redis was coming in. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it. So what is Redis actually? So it's BSD licensed. Um, you can store data structures. Um, you can use it as a database, like as in key value. You can use it as a cache or a message broker, as I mentioned. And it provides data structures such as strings, hashes, list sets, sorted sets, range queries, bitmaps, hyperlog logs, geospatial indexes, and streams. Not that I'm using all of it. I'm just actually mostly using um, get and set objects and sort of like um, message brokering. Um, it has built-in replication. Um, so for fallover uh, safety, um, it supports Lua as a scripting language, um, least recently used eviction, transactions, and different levels of on-disk persistence if you really want to actually store the state, um, but you don't have to. And it provides basically high availability via the Redis Sentinel and automatic partition with the Redis cluster. But it's not something we're looking into uh, from there. But you can see it actually does a lot. And depending on your use case, you might be looking at different things. So um, for installing the server side of things, so on, on a Ubuntu or Debian based uh, system, you can usually install it for, uh, via. Um, your repositories and Ubuntu, you can basically just add an app to repository as Redis Labs Redis. Um, you update it and then you just basically just install Redis and then start it up. And you can also pull it from Docker. Uh, that works as well. So they provide um, public Docker images. Or you can just, if you're old school, then you can just um, compile it basically from source yourself and install it on your machine. Clients is quite interesting. It has a gazillion um, languages that it supports. Um, we're just going to look at the Python side of things today. Um, I've looked at a Java one as well, um, but I'll have to say, having worked with the Python one, the, the one Java one that I was working with wasn't particularly nice. So I have some strange side effects there, unfortunately. The Python one is really amazing to work with. So I really must say, heads up. Cool. So setting up is actually really, really easy. Um, you basically just create a virtual environment um, and then install Redis. And that's it. You're done with your client. Um, right. How you connect is quite easy. You basically uh, import the Redis module and then you create a Redis object. Um, you just point basically at what host your server is running on, what port and what database. Um, so you can have, in theory, multiple databases on there. I'm not sure whether there's a limit on there. Um, and yeah, um, if you wanted to, you could also, if it's not just running on your local host, um, 
or in a secure environment, then you might want to actually ensure that the traffic that's going across the wire, um, that this is actually encrypted via SSL, and then you can um, do that. So you can, for instance, um, the, let's say, nasty way is no host name verification, which you should never do. Um, you can supply explicit certificate files, or you can use um, certify module, um, which um, allows you to use Mozilla's curated list of root certificates. It's all sort of like um, going back to this Redis pipe. Um, client um, has quite a lot of examples on how to use that. Cool. So really, really easy. Um, key value store. So store storing and retrieving data's, uh, data elements via keys. So once again, we create a connection. Um, and then once we have our Redis object, we can just do r.set. The key is foo and the value is var. And then we can use r.get of a key in order to get that back. So it always works with bytes rather than strings. So you would have to do a dot decode if you want to have the string again. Cool. Um, I'm just going to pop out of that one. So whenever somebody has a question, just interrupt me. I'm not offended by that. Um, so I'll just pop over here. Um, and I have a little dog coming in here saying hi. Um, so I'm just going to bring up um, scripts. Um, it. You can see here, in this case, um, I'm importing my Redis module, create a connection, set the value, um, outputting the raw bytes or as decoding. So if I basically um, run the whole thing, oops. you can see first it outputs a byte object with bar and then later on just a string. So that's simple and easy. And um, since it basically operates on bytes, um, you can push any sort of like binary data basically in under a key and then retrieve it. For instance, you can push through images or other binary files that you just load straight from disk. Okay. Cool. Now, getting and setting is quite okay to use, um, but the really nice thing is actually that you can use it as a message broker. Um, and um, so you basically can subscribe to one or more channels so that you can listen for messages coming through. And this works with um, just the usual. You um, connect and then um, the subscription um, is working through a PubSub framework. So on your Redis object, you call the PubSub method. And then you can either use subscribe or p-subscribe um, in order to um, connect a handler. So the handler is basically just a simple method here in the middle, message handler, and then receives a message and they can do something with the message. So whenever something comes through, this message handler will then be called and then that works. So the difference between p subscribe and subscribe is subscribe need, requires you the explicit name of the channel that you're subscribing to. And with p or pattern subscribe, you can have like my underscore star. So anything that uh, any channel that is actually on the server that starts with my underscore will actually then send messages to your particular message handler. And then you can basically run that in a thread um, and to keep sort of like messages coming through. Going back. Right. Okay, and um, that was the one half. Um, so that's the listening part. 
and when you want to send oops, when you want to send things um, that's the broadcasting part and they can just once again create your redis object and then you use the publish method and then send to whatever channel for instance mine is called channel one a message and then you can send to another channel another message now we're going out okay so in the top one i'll be starting um listen and then the bottom one broadcast and you can see in the top one it output two messages so you can see um, there was a p message of type uh, the pattern was such and such and it tells you what channel it was um, once again a byte and then the actual data that is actually part of your message um, so if i just output the broadcast that really is just outputting that and if we instance would change our listen to this channel one and subscribe just to that particular channel and listen to that again um, and then on that again then we can see there's only one message coming through and the type is no longer a pattern message but just a message and as you can see there's no pattern anymore and then just that particular channel Ooh. So, super easy with very hardly any code um, there's other things you can do you can also operate on lists um, so you can basically create lists on the redis server so you can add and remove either from the head or tail you can retrieve the list um, the length of the list you can retrieve slices of the list like you used to in python uh, with lists um, you can get an item via its index you can set an item via the index you can trim the lists and there's a bunch more operations as well um, so here we can see um, at the top there's an r push so that means a right push that means to the list l1 we're adding um typo uh, we're adding the elements uh, b b and a um, and then with l len list length um, of l1 we can output what the length is and um, rather than outputting bytes i'm just doing a little list comprehension here so with l range um, I retrieve from list L1 everything from starting zero and minus one. That basically means to the upper end. Um, so everything in that list, please. And that for each of those elements in that list that I get back from the server, I do a decode so I can output a nice string. And that's the same then basically for all the following examples there. Um, the next little block does basically a left push. So at the head, of the list i'm adding one two and three but it doesn't add them as numbers it adds them as strings or as bytes after it converted it to a string um, i can output the length again and output the list again in the third block um, i'm trimming basically my list on the server and um, it's zero based indices and so from two to five it's a little bit different to uh, what's with um, the range in, in python um, the two is inclusive and the five is inclusive as well. So in range, you would usually only have the lower um, index inclusive and the upper one exclusive. So there's a little bit of deviation there, but well, that's the way it is. And then the last block, uh, we are setting a particular index um, to a value. So the first index, zero, we're setting to a value 11, or actually the string. So when running that, oops. lists. So we can see with our first block, um, we're outputting. We have three elements in there. Um, 
CBA. I have to fix up the presentation there, so that's actually what I'm adding in there. Um, and then when I'm um, doing a left push, so rather than uh, so at the head, I add one, two, and three, and you can see that it's actually adding them as strings. And then I can do my trim. So that's from the third position, like one, two, three, four, five, and six. That's basically all the ones. Um, so we have one, two, three. Oh, I think I actually changed the code there. Oh, I might actually look at that. Um, oh, so we're just quickly looking at that. So I changed this in order to show you that this is actually doing it um, not inclusive. So changing it to four means um, we're only looking at the from the third to the fifth. So one, two, three, four, and five. So we're only outputting one C and B, and it's only outputting one C and B. And then we're setting the first element that we have in the remaining list to 11. Boom. All right. Okay. Other fun things that you can do with it, you can um, increment and decrement um, numeric values. You can have sets, you can have hash maps, you can operate bit operations, uh, you can sort of um, change bits and values. Um, you can do pipelining of multiple commands, uh, which I haven't used, um, that basically allows to reduce the round trip time it becomes a lot faster and there's if you look at the um api has a lot more that it also offers right um so a little application what i'm actually a simplified version of what i'm actually using it for um so i'm using the pups up um for deep learning models and some other applications i use it as a for creating pipelines. So I can basically push in um, from a controlling code an image into one deep learning model that outputs a prediction um, on broadcasts that onto another channel and another model picks that up again, processes that again and outputs again. And then at some stage, the controlling um, Python program basically gets the result back and then does something with it. And um, has a really low load, la a low latency, um, so it is almost instantaneously, um, and it gets around the problem of uh, file polling and any sort of like delays that you have to put in there. Cool. So um, in this little example, I just um, train a little model um, that identifies um, three different um, flower types. Um, it for those who are doing a bit of deep learning, that's an efficient net um, zero network. Um, <clears throat> in my Python code, I basically load in a file, a JPEG file, broadcast that on a channel, and um, the model listens on a particular channel, receives the image from there, pushes it through the model, and then broadcasts basically the prediction. And that's basically where my code listens on again with a message handler and then just simply outputs the prediction. Cool. So um, that's a little framework I wrote last week. Um, the TF Lite, TensorFlow Lite Model Maker. It's based on um, some public code that um, the TensorFlow guys um, made available. But rather than writing code all the time, I actually like having command line applications makes things a little bit easier. Um, and I don't have to um, fiddle with my um, code all the time, adjusting um, paths and other things. So I basically just have a model to train. It's, um, in a directory, I have three subdirectories with um, the flowers. I'm going to show it to you in a second. And I'll put a model. And then for using the model, um, I just basically run that trained model then um, and listen on a particular channel and then broadcast out to another channel. That and um, on my Python side of things for pushing things through. So once again, I create my Redis client. I then 
um, I have my message handler. In this case, I'm just printing the actual content of the message. I once again, um, subscribe to a channel. This is the predictions one where my model will actually send out the predictions. And down here, I basically uh, push through images um, from Alpine Sea Holly, Anthurium, and Artichoke. And for each of those images, I open them as binary, read all the bytes from it, and basically publish that on the images channel that the model is basically listening on. Oh, okay. All right. We can look at some of the images. So that's one of those Alpine sea hollies. Uh, and Ethereum is quite different. Well, British tint and artichokes. Um, also a bit more purpley, but still quite different from the other two. Cool. Just going to train the model from scratch. So you can see that I'm not cheating you. All right. Oh, there we go. All right. First, I'm going to um, train my model on that directory where I just showed you the three subdirectories just for five epochs. So it's just going to be a quick model. It doesn't have to be super uh, accurate. Um, that takes a few seconds. And I don't have a GPU on it, so it would be otherwise a little bit faster. All right, that creates a model. Well, it says it has accuracy 100%. I mean, it's a pick three easy flowers, but anyways. Um, so if you look into the output directory, we now have TensorFlow Lite model and the labels and it's like Alpine C, Holly, Ethereum, and Artichoke in there. Cool, I use that then. I can then run basically my model. So I point to the model, I point to the labels, where I receive the images from and where I send the predictions from and then just a little bit of a bow so I can actually see what's happening. I can run up there. Gibberish. Cool, all right. And then I can on my little Python script that puts the three images through. Oh, so this up here is basically just showing that I'm pushing them through. And um, here I'm basically receiving um, the messages back. I could probably actually make that a little bit nicer. Do a decode on that since it's actually JSON. Again, okay, it looks a bit better. All right, so first image was an Alpine Sea Holly. And if I look at my little Jason that comes back, I have the predicted um, category as an Alpine Sea Holly for 93%. The next one is an Ethereum, which is correct, also 96%. And the last one is an Artichoke, also at 96%. So my model seems to be working at least um, with these three classes. I mean, I'm cheating a little bit because I'm pushing through images that um, the model has already seen, but nonetheless, at least it seems to be doing something right. Cool, and that is the end of my very short presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen. Cool, anyone questions? <laughs>